All right. So, hi everyone. I'm Theseus. Together with Ida, we'll be running you through the our, our course Bare Bones Bash. So this is it assumes no prior knowledge of the terminal whatsoever. We're just going to be teaching you some basic commands, how to get around, what uh, sort of things you can be doing through the terminal, and showing you um, a bit of the magic that Bash can do for you, as well as um, eventually how to make a script that will just run a certain set of commands um, in one go to start slowly automating, simplifying, and making your life more efficient. So the main aim of this session, so Bare Bones Bash is split in two different sessions, one now and one after the break. The main aim of this session is just to familiarize yourself with some basic concepts and commands of Bash. Um, it's, in fact, um, a, a good 80% theoretical, this session, and then the next session is much more practical, but you will be running the commands that I'm showing um, on the screen along in your own little terminals inside the, the VMs. So our objectives, first off, we'll go on over what is a terminal, what is a command prompt, and what the information that the command prompt has in it is, so you can always uh, break down exactly what's going on in the terminal when you look at it. What is the difference between absolute and relative paths? How you can move around the file system and interact with files or directories, create new ones, uh, print the contents of a file, and so forth. We're going to talk about data streams, pipes, and redirects. By the end of the session, you'll understand what those words mean. Don't worry about it right now. Um, I'll show you how to find basic documentation on the different tools that you'll be using on the terminal to see what, what sort of uh, powerful things they can do um, if you ask them. We'll talk a bit about what a variable is as a concept. This is a broader programming concept, not just Bash. Um, then we'll talk about um, a, a peculiarity of Bash, where it separates um, single and double quotes, and they do different things. And then finally, we'll talk about parameter expansion, which is pure witchcraft. Um, and it lets you change what is pulled out of a variable without changing the variable itself, which sounds like a trivial thing, but it's actually extremely powerful. So here in uh, Bare Bones Bash, we have five big commandments, five rules that we follow. Um, and that is how we go through learning coding and learning programming languages. The first rule is to be lazy. If you can be doing something um, today and uh, it will take you an hour to build a script that does the thing that you want, but then, oh, what is that doing? Uh, okay. Uh, but then you can use this script for the rest of your PhD and it will save you five minutes. Then if you're using it every day over the five or four years of your PhD, then it will save you more time in the long run. And that is what you want to be optimizing for when you're coding. You're trying overall to shorten the amount of time you will have to spend, not the amount of time you have to spend today. Because once you have code and it works, it saves you time all the time. Additionally, um, you, you want to be using a tab while you're typing, especially things like file names. Rather than typing the entire file name out, you can type up to a point and then use tab to fill in um, this information on the terminal. And that is an important uh, shortcut. In general, the more you want to find shortcuts and the more efficient you want to make your workflow, the better with coding. Number two. Google or the hive mind knows everything. No matter how complicated the thing that you're trying to do, somebody else has done the same thing and somebody else got stuck doing it and asked someone else who had done it. So 99% of the time, you will find someone who has already solved the problem you're trying to solve. All you need to do is know how to look for the right answers on Stack Overflow and copy their code. Um, don't do so blindly, but you know, oftentimes you kind of have to test it out. And um, eventually I'll talk a bit about how to go about asking Google the right questions so that you get the answers that you want. 
that is an important skill that you get as a programmer over time. Number three is you want to be documenting everything you do. Don't expect that in a year's time when you're looking through your, your code again, you will remember what you did. You will not. Um, so as you're making code, you want to make sure that you put um, comments in, so lines that just state what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, a lot of people, you know, think of it like keeping a lab book when you're in the wet lab. You want to keep track of everything that you're doing, uh, all the little numbers that you're that you're using, um, all the little commands. Keep track of all of this. It will it will save you time in the long run. The fourth rule of bare bones bash is there will always be a typo. Whenever you make code, chances are the first time you run it, it's going to fail because somewhere instead of an A, you put an E or you accidentally added an extra letter or a dot should be an underscore. This happens. You shouldn't be disheart disheartened. Every time we run code, we test it. Now it works and you keep iterating over it until it really works. Finally, don't be afraid of your freedom. Most of the commands that you will be running, um, especially as a, as a novice user, couldn't possibly ruin all your data. So don't be worried that you're going to destroy everything, burn down the servers if you run any code. Just run some code, see if it works. If it fails, you probably just printed a whole bunch of stuff on your screen and nothing has changed. You can try again and try again. Right? So don't worry that you shouldn't run code unless it works perfectly. It's fine if it fails. Okay, so um, James already did the preparation um, parts of opening the VMs and getting our terminals open. So all of you should be looking at something like this. Um, what you see here is the terminal that is the actual entire window, the application you're con currently running. So the black screen with the text, all the, all the stuff that will be printed there, that's the terminal. And within the terminal, we run bash, that is the programming language. And what you see printed on your screens right now is the so-called command prompt. The command prompt has a very specific uh, format. Um, it usually contains the username that you have. In this case, that is Ubuntu, followed by an at uh, here. So this Ubuntu, followed by an at, and then the name of the server that you're connected to. So in this case, for everyone, that would be spam, some number, uh, part of your name, dash, and then some random string. Um, in your own computers, this might look different. Oftentimes, the username will actually be your username or the one that your university has given you. Um, and then after the ad, usually you have, um, again, a unique identifier for the server or the computer that you're at. Um, but it, it doesn't specifically matter. If you connect to a remote server, then it will have the name of that remote server. Um, this is useful when you're not sure whether you have connected, whether you've gotten disconnected. You can always look at your command prompt and work out who you are, on which server you are, as well as where you are. And this is the where you are part. After the server, you will have a colon. And then here it's highlighted in blue. That is your current working directory. So everyone should have a tilde there, this little squiggly line. This, uh, this tilde actually means your home directory, and it's specific for every user on every machine. Um, we'll, we'll look at exactly where that is on the machine in a second. But as we start moving through the terminal, then you will see that this blue part will change from a tilde to a tilde plus other stuff or wherever you happen to be on the server. So on your VM in this case. OK. Now, throughout these slides, um, do feel free to open these slides uh, on your own computers if you want to be copy pasting commands rather than typing them in. Um, the commands we have in this session are not that complicated that you would need to be doing that. But as I said, there's always going to be a typo. Sometimes it's nicer to just paste it in. When you do, always keep in mind in these um, command prompts, we give the dollar sign and then the command. 
that is the dollar sign is you will see it oftentimes also on uh, online forums and so forth as a stand in for the entire command prompt. So that part you do not want to be copying in. You want to copy the commands after the dollar sign. Dollar signs mean specific things in bash. When sharing code, oftentimes it is, as I said, the command prompt within blocks of code. They have special meanings that we will see later on when we get to variables. Um, additionally, when you have multi-line code, so code that expects more input in the next line and the next line, then those lines start with this um, greater than symbol. That you also don't want to be copying in. We've done this on purpose to A, showcase how you would oftentimes find code online, and B, to not make it too easy to simply copy paste things blindly. You need to understand what we're doing every step of the way. So, first off, we're going to start looking at where we are and start talking about the differences between absolute and relative paths. Other than looking at your command prompt that has this tilde in blue to show you exactly where you are, you can also run the command PWD. That stands for print write directory, as in, please tell me where I am. And if you run this at the moment on your terminals, and please do, what you will see is this being printed on your screens, slash home slash Ubuntu. Obviously, that's not the same as tilde. Right? We have gotten something different printed here. And the difference here is simply that slash home slash Ubuntu is what is called an absolute path, while the tilde is a relative path. So the tilde is your home directory, but only for you. If you give code that refers to the tilde to somebody else, that is a different directory for them, and the code is not going to work. Meanwhile, if you give somebody direct, a, a directory structure that starts with slash home slash Ubuntu, like this on a path, then as long as they're on the same system as you, the same server, they will always be able to find this file. Okay? So the tilde is a relative path, but PWD returns an absolute path. So let's talk about the differences between the two. You've just arrived to Leipzig for a summer school that's taking place at MBI EVA. And after some questionable navigation, because it's your first time in the city, you find yourself at the Bayerische Bahnhof and you're tired. You're disheartened and you decide, I'm going to ask a local to find my way around and actually get to EVA because I don't know where I am and how to get there. And let's assume that Google Maps doesn't exist for a moment, right? So you see a friendly looking metalhead and you decide to ask them for directions. Who could that be? <laughs> so this, uh, this metalhead says, I'm happy to help, but I'm a nerd. So I only use absolute paths when I give directions. So from Leipzig Hauptbahnhof, the main station, you can take Kerstrasse southward. You continue straight and take Nürnberger Strasse southward until you reach Strasse des 18. October. And finally, you take Strasse des 18. Des 18. October, uh, moving southeast until you reach Eva. This is the equivalent of an absolute path. It will always take you to Eva, but you can only apply these directions if you start from Leipzig Hauptbahnhof, if you start from the root directory, right? No matter where you are in the world, to get from Leipzig Hauptbahnhof to Eva, you can follow those directions. But they're also not very useful to you since you're not in Leipzig Hauptbahnhof at the moment, right? So you would need extra steps. You would need to go all the way back to the Bahnhof, to the Hauptbahnhof from the Bayerische Bahnhof in order to get to Eva. Yes, Bahnhof is train station. That is, that is a good point, <laughs> right? So examples of absolute paths, as we just saw, we had slash home slash Ubuntu. So this starts from the root directory. This is the first slash. And it tells you exactly how to get to your home directory from that spot. So there is a directory called home. And within that directory, there's a directory called Ubuntu. And in there is your home directory as user Ubuntu, right? Equivalent to that from our above example would be from Hauptbahnhof. You go to Kerstrasse, then to Nürnberger Strasse, Strasse des Arzen des Oktober, Deutsche Platz, and there you are, now you're at Eva. 
Now, obviously, when you're writing code on the fly, you don't want to be typing all of this every time. That's a lot of work. And equally, when you're at the Bayerische Bahnhof and you don't know how to get back to the main station, then that's not very useful. So you're not sure how to get back to Leipzig Hauptbahnhof to apply those directions, so you decide to ask somebody else for, for directions, another local. This friendly local, being Ida, tells you this street that we're on right now, that is the, the Strasse des 18. des Oktober. Just walk straight that way until you walk past the tram tracks and you'll reach Eva. Obviously, those directions are much easier to follow. But if you're anywhere other than right on this street, they're not going to work anymore. Right? If you're one parallel down, you're not going to find Eva as soon as you cross the tram tracks. So these are examples of relative paths, the home, as we saw before, and equally saying from the current directory, that is dot, just follows Strasse der 18. des Oktober to Deutsche Platz de Eva. Notice that this part here is the same as the end of this part. Because Eva is still at the same place, we've just started our navigation at a different spot. Right? We're already in the directory of Nürnberger Strasse or Strasse der 18. des Oktober, and then we move from there. So these directions that Ida gave you are equivalent to a relative path. They're easy to follow empirically, um, but only work when you happen to be at the Bayerische Bahnhof when you start walking. It is the same when you run a script. If you run a script and you have relative paths in there, the moment you change your directory, it's going to break. So when you're making code, you want to use absolute paths. But when you're coding on the fly, relative paths are just more convenient. For the computer, it makes no difference which ones you use, so long as it finds the files that it's being pointed to. So, just to recap, an absolute path is the location of a file or folder from the root directory, and they oftentimes or always start with this slash. And the relative path is the location of a file or folder from your current directory, from where you are right now. When you write code, use absolute paths. When you write on the fly, I mean, I guess you can use relative paths. It's generally better to use absolute all the time, but that's a lot of typing. All right. So let's start with some basic commands. First off, the first command we're going to talk about is ls. That lists the directory contents. And if you do ls in your home directory, then you should see something looking like this. There is a bunch of folders within your home directory, desktop, downloads, documents, uh, mega, x, pictures, templates, and so forth. They don't need to be exactly these ones, but they're probably exactly these ones in this case. So now we can do the next thing that we want. We can make a directory. You can make a directory by using mkdir for make directory. And we're going to make a directory called bare bones bash, all lowercase. And as soon as you run this command, if you do ls again, you will now see that an additional entry has appeared. Here, you will also have one more entry that says bare bones bash, all lowercase, because we've just created an empty directory out of thin air. You can move which is also effectively a renaming of files and directories with MV for move. So if we say move from to move all lowercase bare bones bash to camel case bare bones bash, then we have essentially renamed this directory that we just made from all lowercase to uppercase bare bones bash. Uh, well, camel case is programmer speak for the first letter of each word is capital, while everything else is lowercase. Sorry about that. 
All right. So now if you LS, all of you should see that this bare bones bash directory is now with big Bs. Okay. Now we're going to make our first moving in the file system. We're going to navigate. You can use CD for change directory and you tell it bare bones bash, right? Keep in mind bare bones bash is a relative path because it is from our home directory. We look for the directory bare bones bash. And as soon as you do this, you should also see that the current directory in your command prompt will change and it will no longer say tilde, but it will say tilde slash bare bones bash. Okay. So everyone should now be in this directory. And now we can finally download our first file from the internet using just our keyboard. We're going to be downloading a remote file to this VM. We do this by using wget and then giving the URL of the file that we want to be downloading. So in this case, don't worry about how this file got there. It's just part of the teaching material, obviously. But as soon as you run wget with this, you will get some stuff printed on your screen, like a progress bar and whatnot. The file is too small for the progress bar to be particularly useful. But then once you see your command prompt again, waiting for input, then you should have a single file within your um, this new directory that we made. So you can afterwards check with ls, and you should have a file called boosted dbb meta. All right. So we can then copy a file or directory to a new location. We're going to use CP for this, short for copy. And once again, just like with move, you say from and to. So we're going to copy boosted BBB meta to a new file called boosted BBB meta dot TSV. We're essentially just adding a suffix there. And then if you do a less here, you will see that you now have two copies of the file. You, you should see two files, one boosted BBB meta and one boosted BBB meta dot TSV. All right. Um, now, of course, we don't need two copies of the same file. Um, we could have done this with a move command, but I also wanted to show you how to remove or delete files, remove them from the file system. So if you do RM and then boosted BBB meta, then this file will just be deleted. It's no longer there. And if you do a less again, you will see now you only have one copy, which is the boosted BBB meta dot TSV version, the one that we just copied over. Okay. All right. So we got this file from the internet, but what is this file? What is in it? What are we looking at? Right? Well, we can now look into this file directly from our terminal. You can concatenate file contents to your screen using cat. So if you do cat boosted BBB meta .tsv, you will get the contents of this file printed to your terminal screen. So you can view them directly in front of you. And you should see something that for the most part will look somewhat unintelligible. It will be something like dog funny and some some name to some path and cat uh, artwork name to some other path right now oftentimes you'll be working with really large files for instance um, when you're working with ngs data maybe you want to look inside a fast queue file but you definitely don't want millions and millions of lines printed on your screen you can then be using head and tail to get the first or last X number of lines from your file. So if you do head dash N 10 boosted BBB meta dot TSV, this command here, 
you should only see 10 lines from the entire file printed on your screen, and it will be the first 10. And equally with tail, you get the last 10. Right? So when you have an entire cat, you get the entire file. Do you want just the head or just the tail to get the start or the end of the file? Now, sometimes you don't just want 10 lines of a file. You want to see the whole thing. And you want to see it at your own pace. You don't want everything printed uh, on your, your terminal. Then you can be using less. So less will essentially open a new window within your terminal. The same way that um, if you double click on a text file, it will open up on text edit or any text editor for that matter. And you can look at the contents, but it's not in the same place as everything you were doing so far. So if you do less boosted BBB meta, you'll see now that you have this screen, you have the contents of the file there, you can use the arrow keys to go further down, although the file is not long enough, or left and right, if you wanted to. Um, and then you can exit this, this new window by pressing Q for quit. And then you'll be back in your terminal. All the content of the file is not there anymore, but you've, you've looked in at your own leisure. Oftentimes, when you're looking at fast queue files and things like that, that is the mode that you want to be using. And now finally, we can count how many lines a file has by using WC-L. That is word count the number of lines. So the dash L says that you want lines and not say characters or um, spaces or whatnot. So if you do this on boosted BBB meta TSV, you should get a number printed out. Um, I don't remember how many we had, 15? 15. All right. Has anyone had issues so far, any unexpected behaviors? You didn't get 15 out of the file? No, okay. All right, so now we're going to talk about some more conceptual stuff with, with Bash. We're gonna be talking about data streams, piping, and redirects. These are three linked concepts that work off one another and are quite important to understand. First off, data streams are basically the inputs and outputs of any script that you're using. Any command that we're using always has some inputs and some outputs. They do something. Piping is one of the, one of the amazing strengths of Bash that lets you hook up multiple tools together in, in a single command. Um, so if you want you know, the first 10 lines, but then of those first 10 lines, you want the two last. You can use head and tail and link them together so that you can um, create these more complex commands that do exactly what you want, usually. And then finally, redirects um, is exactly like you would with a, with a stream of water in real life. You can redirect a data stream to put it into a file so that you save it for later either intermediate uh, files or actual output files, you can redirect them or the errors that you that get printed on your screen. So here's, here's how it works. Most programs can take any number of inputs and outputs, but generally there are three default data streams. You have the standard input, which is the input that any script accepts. The standard output, which is the output, and it is the, the bit that actually contains the information you want to be keeping. And then you also get the standard error, which is usually where a script will tell you everything is failing, something went wrong. And usually that will get printed on your screen directly. And oftentimes you might get debug information there, for instance, also. Oh, I've been running for three hours and 77 minutes. That, that would be four hours and 17 minutes. And um, that is where that stuff will be printed. 
through the standard error onto your screen, but you can still be redirecting the standard output somewhere and saving it in a file. So every program that you run basically looks like this. The same is true for the programs we've been running so far, like cat, head, tail, word count, all of these inputs and outputs can be redirected freely. So now let's see how piping works. In bash, and that is a bash thing specifically, you can pipe commands together by using this, this uh, well, the pipe icon. So this is the, the big line uh, that is together with your slash. It's not, an, it's not a lowercase l. And if you say head dash n10 on boosted bbb meta, which we said takes the first 10 lines of the file, and then you pipe that into wc dash l, which prints out the number of new lines that you have in this file, then obviously what you're going to get out, if you take the first 10 lines and say, then say, how many lines do I have here? You will get out the answer 10. So what we have done here, based on the previous uh, figure that I showed you, is basically this. We have one program, which is uh, here. We have one program, which is head. And that takes as input the boosted BBV meta.tsv. It takes the first 10 lines and spits them out into standard output, which, because of the pipe, becomes the standard input for the second program, which is word count, which then, in its standard output, spits out 10, the number of lines after head. If anything had gone wrong along this process, you would still be getting things printed on your screen through the standard error. And then based on the, on the specific message that you get, you would have to work out, is something wrong in head or is something wrong in word count? Because each of them has a standard error that gets redirected to your screen. And now finally, we're gonna talk about the redirects. How can you save the stuff that was being printed on your screen, for instance, into a file that you can use later on? So the standard input can be redirected with the less than symbol, or rather an arrow that points to the name of your program, right? the name of the script that you're running. Equally, the standard output is an arrow that points away or out from that script. And then finally, the standard error is also an arrow that points out, but it's preceded by a two, because it is the second output stream or the secondary output stream. Right? It is also possible to combine streams and say that I want to keep the standard error together with the standard output and pass everything together onto the next program and so forth. But we're not going to get into how to do that here. Just be aware that you can do anything you want. So if we run the command that we had before, getting the first 10 lines of BBB meta and then doing word count, but this time redirecting the output into a file that we call linecount.txt, then you will see that nothing gets printed on your screen anymore because the standard output is no longer making it to your screen. It's been redirected. But now you have an extra file called linecount.txt. And of course, if we cat that file, surprise, surprise, we get the answer from word count dash length or dash lines, right? We have 10 lines in our file. We've just redirected that directly into that file. Obviously, for simple computations like this, this isn't that important. But if you have a script that will run for two days, uh, and then you want to pass that output into another script that will run for a little bit, you definitely don't want the second script to fail and then you have to rerun your first script all over again. It makes more sense to then just save the output from that first script into a file and then read that file in to the second script directly. That's where your redirects will come in handy. Now, we're not going to be using this line count.txt, obviously, so you can just go ahead and delete that. It's important to keep your directories clean as much as possible. 
have clear structure of where everything goes and try to not have, you know, temp one, temp two, test, test.txt, underscore test, test, this is the final one. You don't want files like that in your actual directories. They just make them clunky, hard to read. No one's going to understand what you've been doing. Not even you in two years. All right. So now that we know this, what about trying to learn more about the programs that we're using on the fly, right? You don't always have the luxury of having a book of all possible uh, bash programs next to you that you can start uh, flicking through and, and see all the possible commands you can be doing, right? And you don't always need to be Googling for documentation either. Many programs come with inbuilt help texts. Oftentimes that is by providing dash H or dash dash help to the program or access to online manuals right from your terminal. And that's what we're going to be doing right now. So if you see a new command and it, you can't quite work out what it could be, if it has online manuals, then you could be using what is cat and you will get a one sentence summary of what this tool does. So what is cat? It tells us, well, cat concatenates files and prints on the standard output. That is, that is exactly what we know it to do, right? And you can try this with many different commands. You can try what is head, what is tail, what is less, and you will get an idea. But sometimes you want something more than just a one sentence summary. That is when you can access online manuals for different things. So if you say man cat, which sounds like a bit of a funny command, but it's not that fun, um, you will get a big online manual right in your terminal through the less window that we saw before. So you can be uh, scrolling left, right, up, down with the arrow keys. And you should see within there um, that there's a list of all the different options. So these, these dash something uh, things that you can be providing to cat. So for instance, if I tell you what flag should you give to cat to include line numbers in the output, if you have the manual open in front of you and you scroll down, you will see that it starts saying, oh, dash C does this, dash B does that. And eventually you will see dash N, which shows also prints out the line numbers in the output. That is sometimes useful when you want a specific line out of an entire file. You know, I want line 377. There's no need to go through the entire file necessarily. You can cat it with the line numbers and then use something else to pull out just that one line. Um, familiarize yourselves with the manuals for tools, especially the ones that you use often. It's oftentimes been my experience that I will construct a really complicated pipe to do just the thing that I need and then find out actually I could have just use this one option and it does exactly what I wanted and I, I didn't need to spend 30 minutes on this. You can exit these manuals with Q just like before for quit and then you're back in your terminal. So next we're going to talk about variables. This is a broader programming concept. It's something that is important to understand. Uh, but the specific syntax that we're looking at here is just for bash. So in other programming languages, maybe you, you unpack variables in a different way, but the concept of a variable is central to all programming. So what is a variable? It's essentially a named container whose contents you can expand at will or change. That means imagine it's an Amazon box that has just arrived at your home and the Amazon box could have anything in it. Right? You can, in theory, change what is in the Amazon box at any given time. If you want to send this Amazon box to somebody else, right? you could get the stuff out, put something else in, send it to them. Um, and you can open it at any time that you want. Um, the nice thing about programming is, in theory, you could get the contents out of this box multiple times, which doesn't work with Amazon boxes, sadly. Um, but you could be doing this within your script 100,000 times if you wanted. So expanding a variable, the word that I've used here, basically means opening the box and getting out what you want. But sometimes you don't get out the thing as it is 
but you do things to it in the process. And we'll, we'll see that it's, it's very powerful. It's called parameter expansion. So in bash, you assign variables with an equal sign plus whatever, um, whatever you want in that variable. And then you pull out the contents. So you expand these variables with a dollar sign. Uh, bash is very peculiar about spaces. So your equal sign should not have any spaces around it. So if we say echo, this is my home directory colon dollar home. So if you try running this, you can already see the dollar home is being highlighted here. It's a lighter shade of red. And that is because um, the, the, the syntax is such that it realizes we're talking about the variable home and not just the text home. Everything else is simply text. You can see home here is fine. But as soon as we put a dollar sign in front of it, your computer knows, oh, I should be looking in there and seeing what that is. So if you run this, you will see this is my home directory, home Ubuntu. This variable, home, is actually the path that becomes a tilde. Right? So it's just your home directory, and it will always point to your home directory. And with echo, this new command, we are basically having the computer print out to us what we just told it, hence echo. Right? You tell the computer, hello world, and the computer says, hello world, back with echo. So now we're going to go on a summer trip since uh, rather than being in vacations, all of us are here in the summer school. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Greece because I'm Greek and everyone should go to Greece. Um, so we're going to look at how variables work through this really contrived example. So first off, we have this variable called Greek food and we assign that variable to four. So Greek food now is four. And then we say echo this line and then what gets printed out is greek food is for people who want to know what heaven tastes like right <laughs> so greek food because we are expanding it with a dollar sign gets expanded to four the number that we just assigned there but this is a variable so we can change what it's assigned to we can say greek food is delicious and then we echo this line, and what we get out is everyone says that Greek food is delicious. So we've changed Greek food from a number to a string, to a bit of text. Bash is perfectly fine with that. Whatever is in there, it doesn't matter. It will just expand it, put it where we, where we decided. Right? What if we have a more complex string? Now we want the space in there. So Greek food equals quotes Greek wine, which is a, a bit of a strange thing to say. But then we say echo. The only thing better than Greek food is Greek food. And of course, that will become the only thing better than Greek food is Greek wine. Right? So this gets replaced by the complex string that we've assigned above. And then finally, of course, we can go from a string back to a number at will. We can do anything we want with this variable. And then we echo the next line and we find out, I have been to Greece seven times already this year for the food and wine. Right? So you assign variables at will to whatever you want. You can also do operations on them, although I will not be showing that specifically here. Um, and then you pull them out with a dollar. You can do this within code. It doesn't need to be within an echo command. The echo is simply the easiest way to see exactly what is in that variable at, at that moment. So if you're debugging stuff, that's always a useful thing to have. So one thing to note with bash is that quotes matter. Single quotes and double quotes are not the same thing. And for sure, if you if you have a program that changes your single or double quotes to curly single quotes and curly double quotes, those are definitely not the same thing. You don't want to use those with bash ever. Um, your code will fail. You'll be confused as to why, and then always check your quotes. 
the contents of single quotes are passed on exactly as they are. So Bash doesn't look into it at all. It sees a single quote and it says, okay, whatever is in there, just pass it on. While inside double quotes, Bash will actually interpret what is happening. What that means is sometimes doesn't make a difference. So here we don't have any variables. We don't do anything fancy. We just have a bit of text. So if we say echo, I like Greek food with double quotes or echo, I like Greek food with single quotes, we're still going to be liking Greek food either way. But sometimes, just sometimes, when you have a variable, for instance, then your quote will make all the difference. So you can already see here that the syntax highlighting is picking up that this is a variable, but here that doesn't happen. Right? So what we're going to find out is that pirates say R, but minions say banana, and we're not going to have the interpretation of R as banana, even though we've set the variable there, because this is in single quotes. This will matter in the regex that Ida will be showing you later, because you don't want Bash to interpret those sometimes. You want them to be passed along directly to um, the program that you're using. OK, and now the final, the final big part here is parameter expansion. So here's just an example variable. It's just a random path. Um, you can you can run this so that you have the foo variable assigned on your terminals. But all we'll be doing is just playing around with this. It's essentially just a, a bit of text. Right? It could be pointing to a file, but it doesn't have to. We can do basic expansion of this variable by using dollar curly brackets. In fact, this whole time that I've just been using dollar in the previous slides, Bash already knows that what I mean is actually dollar curly brackets and in the background replaces all those dollars with dollar curly brackets and puts the variables in there. Most of the time, Bash gets this right, but not all of the time. So it's generally a good idea to explicitly use the curly brackets when you're unpacking variables in code. And um, that makes the code more legible altogether because someone knows exactly what part you meant as a variable name. And it also lets you do some more interesting things with the variables, like actually adding parameters to these expansions rather than simply expanding the variable. So if we add parameters to these expansions, those, goes, those go inside the curly brackets. So for instance, if we say echo not just foo, but we add this pound or this hash, and then slash home slash, then what we will get out is the variable that has now lost whatever we had after the hash from the start of it, so from the left-hand side. So you can see here, this used to be slash home slash Theseus, but we've now removed slash home slash, and we just start from Theseus onwards. And this can be done also with, um, with wildcards. So if you use an asterisk, that means anything. So what this will match is it will removed from the le remove from the left-hand side anything that precedes a slash once. So in this case, it just removes the first slash because we only have that, um, that expansion applied once. Takes the entire string, finds the first slash, removes that and everything that came before it, right? Equally, this is the same variable here. We do the normal expansion. We've already seen what this one does. What do you think will happen if we replace the hash with a percent sign? And then we say dot star. So everything after a dot. That should already kind of give it away. What happens is rather than deleting things from the left-hand side, so from the start of the variable, we delete them from the end of the variable. So in this case, 
Once we run this parameter expansion, we get rid of the first slash. In this case, we get rid of everything that comes after the last dot. Not all the dots, just the last, because it only gets applied once. Now, of course, um, sometimes you want to apply these uh, functions more than once, right? And you can do this by adding a second uh, a second time the, the kind of special character for the expansion that you're trying to do. So if you add two hashes, then this pattern of something before a slash will apply over and over until there is no slash left in your string. And equally, with two percent signs, we'll be applying, finding this, these dots over and over until there are no dots left. And hence, we end up, in this case, with what is called the base name, so the file name of this path without all of the directories leading up to it, and the directory name without, um, well, with part of the file name in it, because we just deleted everything after every dot, so all of that part. Okay. So there's more parameters that can be used when do using parameter expansion. This one is particularly useful. You can substitute parts of your, of your variable on the fly. So suppose you're, say, moving files from one spot to another, and you already know that what you want to move is, I want to replace BBB with bare bones bash then you could be using this parameter expansion in your move command. So you would say move my files and then the parameter expansion of that file name. And you can change BBB to bare bones bash. Equally, if here you had a second slash, then it would apply to every instance of BBB in the entire uh, string and not just the first instance. Same way as we did with the percent signs and the hashes. And then finally, if you do not have the second part of this equation here, then bash assumes that you're basically trying to say, I want to replace that with nothing, right? An empty string is the, the programmer term for it. And hence, BBB is simply going to be removed completely instead of being replaced by bare bones bash. There is one more uh, parameter that I want to talk about. It can be useful. It can be very useful in certain cases. It's a bit niche. But when you have a variable and you put the hash before the variable name and not after the variable name, then that expansion actually means I want the length of the variable contents. Suppose you have a number and you want to know, is it in the tens? Is it in the hundreds? Is it in the thousands? You could be using this to find how many characters or how many digits this number has. Or you have a path and you want to know, is it longer than 30 characters long? Or, in fact, you have a list and you want to say, how many items does my list have? Then you can use this parameter expansion. And in this case, where we just have a, a simple path, a simple string, we find out that is 45 characters long. Um, but this is a useful thing to have um, in, your, in your arsenal. It's niche, but when it's useful, it's very useful. So just keep in mind that you can be doing this. If you use bash arrays, which probably you won't use right now, but in the future you may well, then this becomes really useful to find out exactly how many items you have in this array. How long is my list? So this wraps up the kind of, let's say, more theoretical part of this session. Uh, you should now understand the difference between a terminal and the command prompt. You should know what information the command prompt includes. You can always find out exactly who you are and where you are just by looking at your command prompt. You should understand the difference between absolute and relative paths, what data streams are, 
and how they can be redirected, how piping works in Bash, how to quickly find documentation about a tool that you're using. And um, I will tell you right now, if you're using academic tools, it's unlikely you will find that documentation, but it will exist for all GNU tools. So all the stuff that Bash uses, you will find it there. Oftentimes for academic tools, either there's a PDF somewhere online or there's basic help text by using dash dash help that will say, you know, SAM tools, oh, these are all the things SAM tools can do. Now you should understand what a variable is and how to assign and expand them. The difference between single and double quotes in Bash, this is important. And how you can use parameters to manipulate variable expansions on the fly. In the next session that is taught by Ida, you will uh, actually be getting to apply some of these contents, uh, concepts and see them work together to actually achieve something and not just you know, create a directory and get in it. Um, and you'll also find out some new commands on how to clean up a messy file system, rename a lot of files, uh, and do some kind of more dynamic uh, actions. But before we get to that, I would like to briefly mention how you can be accessing the hive mind. This is, this is an important thing. It's really basic pointers, um, but they will make your life a lot easier. You always, always want to include the language that you're using in your search query. As you can see from the pictures, how to cat and how to cat bash are going to give you vastly different results. And it is important because you also don't want results that are from another language and they're not going to work. It's important to broaden your question. You can ask Google, how can I set X to four in bash, but that will only return results where the variable is called X and it's being assigned to specifically four. Instead, you could say how to set a variable to an integer in bash and get back results that have any number of variable names and any number of integer values. This broadens your search and actually makes it the right amount of specific. So when you're more familiar and the more you do uh, coding, you'll get more familiar with the lingo. If you make Google think you know what you want, then it will provide it for you. So instead of saying text, you can say string. Instead of saying a decimal number, you can say, I want a float. Uh, some of these terms can be language specific. So something that could be a float in one language could be a decimal in another language. Um, but in general, once you get into a language, you will, will know which words are the correct ones to use. Uh, so for instance, uh, what in Java is a map, in Python is a dictionary, um, and in, in Bash is an array. As long as you know those words and you use the programming language in your Google search, then you should get much nicer um, results out. Those are the tips for Googling for programming. Um, is there, are there any questions? Is there any part that anyone wants clarification on? Now's your chance. So in this case, you just unmute yourself and speak. Uh, there's no pedestal, so just shout or post in the chat. Or raise your hand. Or raise your hand. Um, would you mind go back to the uh, parameters? Thank you, please. I don't uh, really OK, go again. I was muted, apparently. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. I'm saying, uh, would you mind? Would you mind go back to the parameter that's like? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Next one, like remove all the things before and remove all the things behind. Yeah. So yeah, I want to ask how you. What's the uh, the number sign here means? Like what, what does the specific character means here? Um, which one? So this 
the one above. The one above? You mean the dot or the yeah, yeah. star? Yeah, yeah. The star. Yeah, how the star and the number differs when you want to remove the things. So the star is, it's, it's a regular expression, or I guess technically it's a, a glob, but it just means anything. So okay, it's, and how it about... any number, any number of numbers, any character, everything matches the star. So it's but how just about the number, hmm? a non-number, um, the one, um, before this, before the star. Uh, oh, the hash. The hash uh, just says what you're, so you're providing a parameter to your expansion. Mm -hmm. This bit is the parameter. And then you, with, with these symbols, you are specifying, let's say, the function you're trying to apply to this variable. So when you say a hash, it means I want to remove something from the start. And what is this something? The something is star slash. If you provide a percent sign, you're saying I want to remove something from the end of the variable. OK. So it just tells Bash what you're trying to do with the parameter you're specifying. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, thank you. Yes, so in the chat, Merlin has sent a, a link that explains parameter expansion. Um, it is very powerful. If you want to use that sort of thing, by all means, read up on it. Um, it simplifies code a lot. You will see this also in the next session, how much simpler code can become just by using this powerful technique. 